Well, I'm delighted to welcome you back as we're continuing our studies of the book of Romans. We're coming, as you know, this time to uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, one of the most intriguing texts, in some ways a mysterious text, but one that I think we'll see in the great scheme of things as Paul is working it out, fits perfectly in his overall plan to set forth to us the essential content of the Christian gospel. We've noticed that we are now dealing with the subject of sanctification. Sanctification, as you know, is that process whereby God leads us, working through His Spirit, to increasing holiness, culminating, of course, in glory at a different time, in a different place, but throughout our lives He is working on us so that we grow in grace, and as time goes by, the expectation is that we become increasingly conformed to the image of Christ. Sanctification is thus distinct from justification, first of all, because justification is something that takes place at a point in time, as we were saying. It takes place at the moment that, to use the biblical language, God calls us. Those whom He foreknew, He predestined. Whom He predestined, He called. At a certain particular point in your life, God called you, and that was the moment that your heart came alive, that God touched you with His grace. He replaced a heart of stone with a heart of flesh, and out of that came faith, and out of that faith, and as a result of it, came justification. That's punctiliar. It takes place at a point in time. And then starting from that point on through the rest of your career as a Christian person, you grow. The biblical metaphor likens us to those who would start off like infants, drinking milk, just child's food, and gradually we increase in our understanding of things and our experience and so on until finally we can eat solid food and eventually, of course, we can become adults in the faith. Well, that's the idea of what happens spiritually. We start off as infants, but we grow, and as we grow, we become more powerful, more robust in the inward man and that this is all taking place in a process that Paul calls sanctification. And that's been the traditional term that's used down through church history, and of course it's the one that I'm using with us at this point. Well, sanctification is only possible because God has liberated us through Christ from sin. We came into this world slaves to sin, attached to it, legally bound to it, and the law was the tyrant that kept us, in a sense, trapped because the law would constantly measure and expose and arouse within us those sinful passions. And so what takes place in the moment of redemption is that the death of Christ is applied to us so that every obligation we ever had to the law has been perfectly fulfilled. It's been fulfilled in Christ. At the same time, God plants within us a deep and heartfelt desire to obey the law. And that becomes the very purpose of sanctification, to lead us in this path toward increasing conformity to God's law, even though, technically speaking, we're not under law. But the fact that we're not under the law becomes the liberation within us to obey the law. Paul asked the question back in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, do we destroy the law through our faith? Absolutely not, he responds. Rather, we establish the law. This becomes the very means whereby the law can be established in our lives. The irony is, of course, as we're freed from the law, we become those who indeed can finally live substantially according to its requirements. Well, sanctification has certain uh, risks. There are certain ways in which we can uh, veer off to the left or to the right. And last time we were talking about the error that can be made, in a sense, to the left is the error in the direction of antinomianism, a kind of lawlessness, an abuse of the notion of grace that says, because I'm not under law but under grace, therefore law doesn't matter. Therefore, any sort of life of conformity to the standards of God's requirements don't apply to me. I'm not going to worry about it because I'm free from the law. That sort of abusive view of the law, of course, heads in a direction of a libertine kind of approach to things that basically represents a despising of God's law and indeed a despising of God's holiness. And Paul rules that out, and that's what we saw at the latter part 
of Romans chapter 6. Now he changes his focus and begins to look at the other side of the discussion, the opposite of antinomianism, which is legalism. Legalism becomes a preoccupation with the law, putting ourselves back into a state of mind in which we essentially reduce our understanding of the obligation to God is simply one of obeying rules and regulations, and we don't let it go any further than that. And of course, that also represents a tragic misapprehension of what Christian sanctification is really all about. And so we want to pick up this discussion of legalism now. Paul famously takes it up in chapter 7, and the entire chapter is really devoted to those who may have this legalistic tilt to them. Generally, commentators agree that the latter part of chapter 6 is addressing itself more to the Gentile Christian converts who may have a tendency to drift back into a more antinomian kind of practice, whereas chapter 7 seems to be addressed more to a Jewish Christian convert, one who by, by uh, uh, the way they were raised and the training they've had and so on, education, might be inclined more toward a, a kind of a law-oriented approach to the Christian life. So let's take a look at it. We're in Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. We'll read the first short paragraph and then comment as we go. This is the Word of God. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only during that person's lifetime. Thus a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's discharged from the law concerning the husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulterer. So Paul introduces the conversation with this interesting discussion of marriage and the idea of being married to someone. And he's going to use that as a metaphor to explain our relationship to the law. So we'll take a look at that right after we have a word of prayer. Great God in heaven, we are grateful to you that though we came into this world tied, bound up, and obligated to your law, and impossibly, hopelessly, trapped in an inability to do what it requires, that you have reached us in your grace and liberated us through Christ. We give you thanks for that, and we pray that as we explore the basic meaning of that, that you would open our eyes and our ears that you would give us that ability to appreciate and understand these things that you have done for us through Christ. And we give you thanks for all of that in the name of Christ. Amen. So Paul starts off, Do you not know, brothers? And he here now intimates that he's speaking to those who know the law. You see, in the latter part of chapter 6, he was talking to folks who might be inclined to be lawless. Shall we disregard the law? Shall we sin because we're not under the law? Well, that'd be a kind of Gentile approach. The Gentiles, of course, came out of rank paganism where their religious motives were infiltrated with a kind of lawlessness. And, of course, for them, there would be a tendency, if there was any tendency at all, to drift back into that kind of lawless outlook. But now Paul is shifting to those who may have an inclination toward being overly lawful, that is to say legalistic, preoccupied with it, and he addresses themselves to them. So though he doesn't mention a Jewish audience by name here. Generally, it's taken for granted that that's who Paul has in mind. I'm speaking to those who know the law, and he says the law is binding on a person only during that person's lifetime. This, of course, reminds us of the theme that's been working its way through all the way uh, in, in this entire discussion. The law is binding only during a person's lifetime. As Paul said in chapter 6, he who has died is freed from sin, and we might also say freed from the law. Chapter 6 made it clear that we died. When Christ de- died, that death he accomplished was applied to us. From God's point of view, we were there on the cross. We paid the penalty. We met every obligation that the law could require from us. We perfectly satisfied its standards. 
through Christ, and thus there is a deep sense in which through the death of Christ we have died to any obligation the law may have made uh, or we may have had to the law. We've, we've uh, had a, a termination of that legal relationship that we otherwise were bound to. And he's likening that in a sense to marriage. He says, thus a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's discharged from the law concerning her husband, using a very simple illustration and one that, of course, all of his audience was familiar with, and so are we. There is the institution of marriage for as long as the human race has been around. It's been there. And there is an idea that two people come together in a marriage bond and that there is a requirement that they stay together. Now, obviously, some cultures are a little bit more loose in the way they um, uh, implement those standards than others, but certainly Paul, writing to a Jewish audience in the first century, was writing to people who had a very clear and distinct idea of what he was saying at this point, that when two people married, the wife especially, as he highlights here, was bound to her husband, and that the only thing that would separate those bonds of marriage would be the death of her husband. And as long as he was alive, she was tied legally to that relationship. Now, what's he saying? In a sense, what he's saying is that using the metaphor of marriage to illustrate the point, we came into this world married. We came into this world bound in a kind of marriage to a law. The law was our husband. And there was no possible way for us to escape from that relationship. And that relationship was one, of course, which resulted in our guilt because we were unable to do what the law required. And so the longer we lived, the more deeply we became indebted to the requirements of the law and more impossible were the prospects of our escaping from it. And Paul sort of likens that to a marriage in which a woman might be married to a husband who is relentlessly tyrannical, we can imagine, and yet there's no possible way that she's able to escape from the relationship. And so Paul paints that picture for us to try to help us understand that that was our situation coming into this world. We were trapped legally under a law which increasingly mounted upon us the guilt and the obligation to do what it required when we were quite unable to do so because of original sin. And then Paul continues, Accordingly, she'll be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. In other words, just highlighting the impossibility of escaping that relationship. But if her husband dies, she's freed from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Now, it's a very simple illustration. And Paul is making a profound point using a fairly obvious kind of uh, analogy here to the relationship of marriage. The thing we might be wondering at this point, if we listen to the way Paul's describing it, is we think about a woman who's married to a tyrannical husband, and the only way she can escape that relationship would be if her husband dies. And if we analogize that to our relationship to the law, then we might think, well, that would mean that the law would have to die. But of course, we can't imagine how that would happen. The law is not going to die, and then it seems that we're faced with an impossible dilemma. And we're not sure exactly what point Paul is going to be making here based on this kind of strange sort of comparison that he's drawing. But then he throws at us an unexpected curveball, which explains the reason that he's using this analogy. And this is what we find then beginning in verse 4. Notice what he says. In the same way, my friends, you have died to the law through the body of Christ. You have died. You see, that's what's unexpected. In the marriage, we thought the husband would have to die so the wife would be free to marry another. But as it turns out, in this situation we're describing concerning ourselves in the law, we die. How did we die? We died through the death of Christ. Christ was nailed to a cross. His body died. And through the death of Christ on that cross, and that death being applied to us, we died. And it's simply to say theologically that whatever the law could have required of us, 
whatever stipulations it may impose, whatever standards would otherwise be obligatory. We have met the standards. We have done all that the law could have demanded of us in Christ. He has paid our guilt, everything the law demanded in terms of punishments against us for our infractions. He has met that standard. And more than that, He's given us His perfect life. The perfection of His righteousness has been imputed to us. So the law has no complaints. There's nothing more that the law can demand of us because, in fact, it's all been met. Now, when we use the law in this way, all we're really saying is that the righteous integrity of God, that sense in which God must have obedience because He is holy, all that He could require of us has been satisfied. How did it happen? We died with Christ. And the same thing that liberates us from sin in chapter 6 of Romans liberates us from the law in chapter 7 of Romans. So that in, in chapter 6 we are able to escape an antinomian approach to the Christian life and in chapter 7 we're able to escape a legalistic approach to the Christian life. We have been freed through the death of Christ. So Paul says, you have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit to God. Just as a woman could not marry another unless her husband died, in this case, we couldn't be given to another unless, in this case, we died. But that's what Paul says has happened. We died to the law, and now because we've been raised to newness of life, Romans chapter 6, we have this opportunity to be joined in a kind of marriage to someone else. And the one that we are joined to is, of course, the very one who died for us, and the one with whom we died, and the one who becomes the very definition of our new existence, the very newness of life that we have, is as a result of the fact of what, of what Christ has done for us. His redemption is now applied, and we're married to Him. And so Paul is pushing this analogy a long way. I grant you that. And some people think Paul is being a little bit extreme in the way that he rings illustrations out of this uh, relationship, uh, this uh, description of marriage and so on, but I'll leave that to your own uh, musings. But in any event, that's where Paul is going. And then he adds this additional thought here at the end of verse 5, that we uh, who have been raised from the dead may bear fruit to God. And of course, the picture of fruit that we find in the Scripture always sends us to Galatians chapters 5 and 6 where we hear of the fruit of the Spirit. And that is probably what Paul has in mind here. For us to bear fruit to God is simply to say that in our lives we begin to demonstrate the effects of this new organic connection we have with Christ so that our lives actually produce the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, as you know, is really just the character of Christ in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, all of those wonderful qualities are nothing that we could dredge out of our own psychology. We can't do it. But the fact of the matter is that by virtue of this connection we have with Christ, His life courses through us. And the Spirit, taking up its residence in us, produces in us the very character of Christ. Christ is born in our lives, and that becomes this wonderful picture of what's going on in a new relationship that we have. How do we, how do we have this intimate connection to this new husband? By surrendering to him. Present yourself. Present your members. Surrender to him entirely. Embrace him as Lord, Master, Sovereign, Savior. And that's the great liberating principle that begins to give rise to this wonderful expression of bearing fruit to God. Paul says, while we were living in the flesh, while we were living in this former manner of life, what he otherwise calls the old man, the person we were before regeneration, before conversion, when we were in the flesh, he says, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. This is the strange irony, of course, of all forms of legalism, and it's the irony that describes people who are attempting to produce a life 
of obedience to God by dredging out of their own resources the energy to do so. What they find is the harder they try, the worse it gets. Paul uses this interesting description of the uh, uh, law arousing in sinful passions in our flesh. And that's really the way the law works, isn't it? We have this fundamental uh, sinful impulse, but until the law comes along and defines something concretely as being off limits, it really doesn't have a, a fulcrum, as it were. It doesn't have a, uh, any leverage. But we all have this experience. When we hear the law saying, don't do that, when we find out something is off limits, when we discover that there's something to, uh, from which we are prohibited, some, uh, some uh, barrier, some restriction, then all of a sudden that thing, which is off limits, becomes very, very interesting to us, becomes alluring to us, becomes fascinating to us. The law arouses our sinful passions, you see. And this is the strange thing about the legalists. The more they want to be pure, and obedient the more they find themselves frustrated by their own sinful passions. The great Christian saint uh, of uh, the 4th, 5th century, St. Augustine, whose name you recognize, I'm sure, tells an interesting story in his confessions about an experience he had when he was a young boy, probably in his teenage years. And he says that he went with some friends of his and stole pears from a pear orchard. And later on in his life, as he's reflecting on that incident, he finds the greatest degree of grief in just remembering it. Now, he did a lot of things as a youth that were not very exemplary, you know. But this one seems to stand out in his mind as one of the most horrific of all. And we might wonder, when Augustine was given during his early years to drunkenness and escapades that were immoral and so on, we might think, why in the world was stealing the pears such a big deal to him? But when we read him closely, we realize that the reason that he was so upset with himself for stealing those pears was because he didn't like pears. He didn't steal the pears to eat them. In fact, he wound up throwing them to the pigs. He didn't want the pears, he didn't like the pears, he had no desire for the pears, but he did take pleasure in doing something just because it was wrong. The pure pleasure of doing something just because it's wrong. And doesn't it sometimes seem remarkable when you reflect on your own experience how the very fact that something is off limits makes it so desirable? The very fact that there's prohibition makes it alluring. We have an expression we use, the forbidden fruit. Somehow fruit that's forbidden seems more desirable, more delicious, and we just want to think about it and finally cave into it. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. The law arouses the sinful passions within us. As soon as the law gives us a restriction, that creates the opportunity for sin to fixate on that thing and turn it into some kind of idol, some kind of mechanism by which we can resist the authority of God and go off on our own escapade, disregarding that which he has required of us. And that's the great dilemma of the legalist. That's the great dilemma of someone who wants to justify himself or herself before God based on performing what the law requires, is that it's only going to increasingly create the frustration, a kind of quicksand of inability to do this that the law requires. Paul continues, Now we have been discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we are slaves not under the old written code, but under the new life of the Spirit. We have been freed from that sort of legalistic approach. We've died. The law is satisfied. Legally, it's satisfied. And now we are in a relationship to a husband, Christ, and our service to him is motivated by a deep love for him rather than some desire to meet some standard, some debt that we owe to the law. And hence we see these two great 
uh, reefs, as I was saying earlier, that represent the threats to Christian sanctification. The Christian on the one hand who tilts toward antinomianism would be like a husband who says of his marriage that he has a great marriage, but he doesn't do any of the things that the uh, marriage vows require. He's not faithful to his wife. He doesn't come home at night. He you know, goes around doing things that uh, clearly represent a kind of disregard of his marriage vows. And then he says, but it's okay because I'm not a legalist. I'm free in this relationship to live this way. Well, I think you know as well as I do that any marriage that proceeded on those terms wouldn't last very long. Even though marriage is fundamentally driven by a loving relationship, there is a law there. And if the marriage is going to survive, it's going to survive because there's a law that the two people are indeed respecting. But they're doing it out of heartfelt affection for each other, not out of a sense of uh, sort of drudgery and duty. On the other hand, a legalistic husband might be someone that does everything in a picture-perfect fashion, like clockwork, performs all of the things that a husband ought to do, and yet is doing it simply as a perfunctory expression of his own ability to simply meet a standard. And a wife who was married to such a husband might begin to think after a while that she's not so sure this is all that great. She wants the heart of her husband, not simply the behavior, not simply the performance, not simply his kind of mechanical production of husbandly uh, behaviors without any sort of heartfelt affection. The fact of the matter is, in a true and proper marriage, two people have made promises. They've taken vows to live together after God's holy ordinance, to care for one another, to love one another, to cherish one another, to be faithful to one another. And those are certainly a law of sorts, and yet it is a pure joy to keep those laws. Those two people are not resenting constantly the fact that they are bound by this law of a marriage because their affection for each other gives them a wonderful joy in doing the very thing that that law requires. And that's the way it is with Christ. We've gotten rid of a bad marriage, as it were, to a law that was tyrannical and only exacted from us what we couldn't perform so that we can be married now, in a sense, in a new and wonderful relationship to one. And in this relationship, our marriage, marriage vows become the very joy of our lives. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's the heart of the matter. If we love Christ, then keeping his commandments is going to be our greatest joy. And it's precisely because we love him that that would be the case. We don't do it in a sense because we have to. We do it because we want to, because we've been liberated to it by the very uh, power of grace within us. And it is very much like a marriage now in which the fruit that we bear is the fruit that the law requires and much more. Paul says to us in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is, and he spells it all out, and then he says, against these things there is no law. You see, the law restricts us, says don't do this, don't do that. But the fruit of the Spirit rises far above any of the restrictions of the law and does wonderfully more than the law would ever require. And that's the nature of bearing fruit to God. And it comes only by virtue of this new relationship we have with God through Christ, in which working with the Holy Spirit working within us, we are moved then to a life of sanctification, a life of holiness. So Paul has given us the two great uh, perils. Uh, antinomianism on the one hand, legalism on the other. We're not quite done with legalism yet. Paul is going to plow in now in the rest of chapter 7 to a discussion of the way in which it can be so frustrating from a legalistic point of view to try to do what God has required when in fact we find the inability to do it. And so we're going to take up the rest of Romans chapter 7 next time. And then after that, we get to Romans chapter 8, which of course gives us the wonderful third alternative. Not antinomianism, not legalism, but liberty in the spirit. And that wonderful chapter will be on the agenda uh, at that point. Again, it's been great to be with you, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again next time. And until then, may God richly bless you.